we do have an excellent uh, session right now, so I do want us to begin. Um, so we've heard a lot today, a little bit about the UC Davis story in terms of becoming an emerging HSI, what we've been doing in order to get there. Um, and as Dr. Francisco Lopez said, is that we have not completed the task. Um, and so this panel is to talk a little bit about what we are currently doing to achieve that status from, I'd say, a departmental level. Um, so I have three panelists here today. We have uh, Robert Penman, our Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions, who will talk about what we're doing on the undergraduate admissions side. We have um, Rodrigo Bonilla, is the Director of our Center for Chicanx and Latinx Academic um, Student Success Center. Um, as well, and we have um, Josephine Moreno, our Graduate Diversity Officer for the Humanities and Arts, Social Science and Education in Graduate Studies. And they will each be addressing one prompt. Um, they're gonna be addressing, you know, they're gonna share with the audience how the campus priority of achieving HSI has impacted the work of themselves and their unit. So that's the specific question they're gonna be answering. So I'll introduce Robert. Good morning. I think it's still morning. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Pemmon, Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions here at UC Davis. Um, he, him, his pronouns. It's, it's good to be with you here today. And thank you to Dr. Mendez and the Planning Committee for the invitation to, uh, to join. And thank you, Melissa, for the question. Um, the focus on HSI and reaching HSI as a designation has, has certainly impacted our work in a number of ways, but I, I think that the best way to sum it up has been with words that I've heard a lot today, which are servingness and intentionality. Um, to, to start with some context, I arrived here at UC Davis in the fall of 2021, so much of the effort and work that has gotten Davis to this point really comes at um, the, the uh, experience and intentionality of others before me, so I just really want to recognize that. Many of you are in the room. Um, today who have contributed to that uh, to that effort and and really just wanted to acknowledge that um, UC Davis has been on a growth trend for about 10 years uh, for the past 10 or so years We have been growing pretty substantially uh, between 2011 and 2021 We grew by about 30 percent of, of, of the undergraduate student body, which is fairly significant uh, growth and pretty aggressive growth and newly enrolled Latino students, Latinx students, grew significantly, significantly over that time period as well, not just in terms of raw numbers, but in terms of uh, a percent of the new student population. So we went from 19% of the population, the undergraduate population in 2013 to about 23% in 2021. So that is growth with intention at a time where we are becoming also more selective as an institution. Uh, and recognizing the strengths of our rising scholars has certainly been a uh, key to that push. So we've been right around this 24, 24 and a half percent marker for quite some time now, and um, uh, the, the department, for at least from the admissions side, is very much eager to get us over uh, that, final, that final 25 percent milestone. There's a couple of things that, that I think that we um, are incumbent to do in admissions and, and in our work, and um, so I've got two points that I kind of want to talk about, and one is Strategic partnerships um, and, and serving our college access and academic preparation programs that, pr that serve Latino students in a culturally relevant and localized manner. And I've got a, a couple of, of examples for you. Um, so we have been working very hard over the past, um, over the past decade or so, and actually maybe even longer, um, to develop and foster relationships with academic preparation programs that are doing the hard work of, of helping more Latino students access higher education as a concept, EAOP, TRIO programs, SAPEP programs, Puente, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and these partnerships, we really approach them with intention. We approach them not in the sense of, of you know, let me come talk to your students about UC Davis, right? It's always never, it's never about Davis necessarily, as much as it's about what can we do to help you, to serve you as an organization, to better serve your students, your parents, counselors and whoever you are working with. Um, so what, we can we, what can we do to help your cause? What can we do, how can we be of service to you, to your students, to your parents? Um, we recognize that 75% of our Latino ad, uh, applicants to UC Davis are the first in their families 
to attend high, uh, higher education, to attend college. Um, and we use that as, uh, we, we take that approach intentionally to help students navigate the complex uh, ecosystem of higher education in the United States, certainly in the state of California, and, and by um, absolutely 100% the University of California. And, and so we approach that in that way. We also, want, we also want to meet students and parents and families and, and counselors where they are at, right? What, what information do they need um, and provide that as, as much as we can uh, and offer it in a culturally, culturally responsive manner. Can we offer it in Spanish? Can we offer it, uh, uh, make it available for parents as well um, so that they can navigate the process with their students? One such example is our partnership with Stockton Scholars. Um, I am a native of Stockton, California, just a short drive down the freeway from here. And Stockton Scholars is a college access organization that provides um, not only um, education access programming, but also retention services, uh, as well as financial investment in students um, from Stockton Unified School District. Nearly 70% of the students in Stockton Unified are Hispanic. Um, and so we have uh, long been a program supporter of their winter summit, uh, their summer academies as well, providing workshops on everything from the University of California to financial aid, the personal insight questions, application workshops, what have you. Um, we always use, you know, we use Davis examples, of course, because we want them to know about Davis. Um, but, but we really are focused more on the mission of access to higher education as a concept. And so that is what we have been doing. Um, I'm also a member of the board of Stockton Scholars, and we recently embarked on a partnership to promote the scholarship opportunity to the students who have been admitted to UC Davis in, in um, Stockton. And um, there were, well, I won't give you the exact number because it's a little too early to tell you the exact numbers, but um, we, we messaged a couple hundred students who had been admitted from Stockton Unified um, and let them know that this was an opportunity. If you're going on to higher education, there's a financial opportunity that's available to you that you may not know about. Um, many of the students had already applied, but there were a handful that had not, and we found out just yesterday that five or six students had actually taken up that opportunity to, to seek out that additional money uh, and support, and so we're very, very happy about that. So the point being is that meaningful, meaningful engagement with the intention to ensure that students have access and equitable access to information uh, in a culturally responsive manner when possible is, is important. Um, these deepening relationships have, have paid off for us, uh, certainly in terms of enrollment, but, but certainly making sure that students have support once they arrive here um, to campus. We've been bringing more and more students to campus from these organizations that we've developed partnerships with, uh, turning those, those campus visits into more meaningful experiences, not just your standard campus tour, but can we introduce them to current students? Can we introduce them to faculty? Can we introduce them uh, to staff on the student support side of the house to, to show that there is a community of, of support here um, at UC Davis? Um, the second thing that I think is really important to us, and I think Francisco will uh, appreciate this, is really about disrupting um, the way we do our work in admissions administratively. Um, I think it is incumbent upon the university to really think about all of the processes that we put in place uh, as gatekeepers for students. And I'll give you an example um, for, for UC Davis recently. Up until this past year, we required every student who, who was put onto the wait list, who was offered a space on the wait list, to write a little statement, 200 words. They were required to do it, required to write a statement, 200 words, um, about why they wanted to come to UC Davis, give us some updates about their grades and, and things like that. But they were required to do so, do so. And we looked at the data of students who were opting into the waitlist process and realized that disproportionately students who were African American, Latino, Native American were not opting into the waitlist process. Um, not a surprise probably to many of you in the room who recognize that any barrier is a barrier. Um, and, and so what we decided to do is take that away. We took that requirement out. It's there as an option. Now I'm gonna choke on myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we took it as an option to remove that barrier. And um, I, I would just wanna note that today is the 23rd. We released admission decisions two weeks ago. So 
This is, students still have three weeks to opt into the waitlist process and already opt-ins from Latino students are up 40%. Opt-ins from African Americans are up 35%. Opt-ins from Native American students are up 75%. So that it is one example, one, one very small example, and certainly the number of students who opt into the waitlist does not necessarily mean that they will ultimately enroll to UC Davis that we'll be able to opt for them admission. But I can't offer admission to someone who's not in the pool to begin with, right? And so that has been, um, that is, those are just two very small examples of how our work has changed um, as a result of the focus on HSI. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. So now we're going to transition and talk, learn a little bit more about what we're doing on the retention front with Rodrigo. Testing. Oh, there we go. All right. Now, okay, so it works now. Perfect. Um, buenos dias. My name is Rodrigo Bonilla, and um, I have the privilege and the honor to serve as the director for the Strategic Chicanx and Latinx Retention Initiative and the Center for Chicanx Latinx Academic Student Success here on campus. And so, um, as Robert mentioned, right, my work actually begins once students get here to UC Davis. So once we get them here, then it is my responsibility to make sure that every student has the support and the access that they need. And so um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what being a Hispanic servant institution would mean for my work and for my team, right? But um, before I, I really get into that, I, I want to acknowledge and say that the institution has been committed to serving Latinx students for a while now, right? This is not just something that we're beginning because we're now an emerging HSI. In fact, you know, my strategic uh, retention initiative was established back in 2015. And um, after the initiative was established, two years later, uh, they uh, opened up El Centro um, in 2017. So we just celebrated our fifth year anniversary, right, of, of being open to serve Latinx students on this institution. And um, it's been growing drastically, right? Uh, the population has been growing, and uh, as a result, also the, the way that we approach our work, the way that we continue to center how we serve and how we support students is, um, is changing, right? But before I proceed with telling you a little bit about how we actually do that, I really do want to give a shout out to my team. And the reason for that is because they are the ones showing up to this institution every single day, meeting with students on a daily basis, right, to help them understand academic policies, to help them provide advice on what classes to take, to help them how to get to financial aid, right? So I want to give a huge shout out to my associate director, Daisy Martinez, and Roxanne Flores, who's my office coordinator. So, so um, thank you to them for, for, for truly, as I said, showing up to do the work every day and, and to meet with those students individually. So just to provide you a little bit of perspective, um, we have on average um, over 7,000 students, right? And uh, as I just gave my team a shout out, that also tells you the entirety of what my team is, right? It's, it's composed of three career staff. And so for us, we really have developed a system and a model rather, right, to, to truly serve students and, and to help understand what that means, right? And so this model is, consists of three different components. So the first one is research and data, the second one is partnerships, and the third one is services, right? And I wanna go a little bit more in detail um, in terms as to how this model works and how it looks like in practice here at UC Davis, because like I said, we've been doing this for, for five years now, right? And so my work will not necessarily be impacted in the sense of like we have to start something brand new, because we already have a system that we know that works, right? It'll just be a matter of continuing to adjust this model to make sure that we are understanding what the needs are of our students, because they do change even just from year to year, right? And so um, I wanna focus on that first component, the research and data. Research and data truly informs the way that we approach the work that we do. So how do we actually do that, right? Uh, aside from stay, uh, staying on top of all of the scholarship that's being produced and all of these different servingness frameworks that I'm sure all of you are aware of, right, of, of what it means to serve Latinx students, we as, also actually collect our own data here internally, right? Um, our student affairs assist assessment team has actually developed a homegrown system, which we call the swipe system, where we are able to track all of the interactions that we have with students in our space, 
right? And this is super, super critical in terms of the way that we utilize data. Why? Because when a student comes into my space, I know why they're coming in. Two, it lets me know who's actually coming into my space and who's not, right? Three, it tells me, are they utilizing this service or not utilizing that service? That tells me the effectiveness of that particular service, right? And if I need to change, if I need to modify, right? In addition to that, um, it tells me literally how many students are accessing certain services where the opportunity for growth, for growth is for me and my staff and how we need to change that, right? Um, in addition to that, we also utilize the business um, intelligence, um, BIA, I'm forgetting the acronym now, and I work with them very closely, uh, Business Institutional Analysis. There you go, I got it. Um, and this is such a key, important um, data source for us. Why? Because as earlier, when Alondra was talking about you know, the previous director reaching out to them because they were in academic probation and bringing them into the space to help them navigate that process, this is how we get that information, right? So it's real-time data that we have access to where we then take initiative to say how many students are facing academic difficulty, how many of them are on academic probation, and how many of them are on subject to dismissal to truly reach out to them, right? We've also taken a, a different approach now where we've changed some of the language. We've changed the way that we reach out to those specific students because we understand that it's a vulnerable situ situation that they're in, right? And a lot of them, you know, as we heard earlier, they don't want, just want to respond because they're like, I'm in academic probation. Oh my gosh, what does this mean, right? So we've really worked to, to change that. And so that means that we're reaching out to students, helping them understand this is a process, but also not just telling them this is a process, but normalizing it. Right? Because the reality is, just to give you a little bit of perspective, we have about a thousand students who are in academic difficulty every single quarter. That's a lot, right? And once they realize that there's other Latinx students on this institution who are facing that same, you know, uh, situation, they're a little bit, uh, they feel more comfortable and, the, and that helps them, you know, uh, navigate that process better, right? And so the importance of the use of data and how we use it to then form, formulate really retention strategies that we practice in our space is super critical. Not only does it help us inform um, you know, the, the retention strategies, but it also helps us inform our partnerships, which is the second component of, uh, of the model that we have here at UC Davis, right? Our partnerships are truly informed by where are the gaps that exist in services for our students. And what we do is we reach out to those specific partners and then we bring that specific service into El Centro so that the student can come into El Centro, access that service with someone that looks like them, with someone that they identify with, right? And that importance alone is so, so critical for the retention of our students, right? And so for us, that's how we also engage with um, institutional partners to keep them accountable, right, to serve Latinx students because I know, as many of you know, serving Latinx students should not be just the responsibility of my unit alone or of HSI or anybody, but it, it has to be an institutional commitment, right? And um, this is the way that we keep our institutional uh, institution accountable, right? Partnering up with them, developing super intentional partnerships. And as we heard earlier, partnerships are so, so critical to the success of our students, right? And then based on those partnerships, I'm gonna take you now briefly to the third part of our model, which is our services. We're able to then provide services in our space, as I mentioned, um, with folks that look like our students, with, with folks that our students identify with, right? So as of now, El Centro provides a menu of services, right? And our focus is entirely providing academic support, right? But we do it in a holistic sense, right? So what does that mean? That means that we offer academic advising on a daily basis. So myself and Daisy, are trained academic advisors. We literally sit with students, we build schedules with them, we help them interpret academic policy, we also help them understand what their options are. Because the reality is, that's why our students are leaving. Because they get scared and because nobody sits down with them to tell them these are the options, right? These are the options that you have so that you can come back to Davis if you are dismissed. So we sit down with our students and we do that type of work. 
right? We provide them not only with an academic schedule, but we help them understand these are all of the different requirements that you must fulfill in order for you to graduate at UC Davis. Because most of our students also have, um, a, you know, it's a very difficult uh, situation to try and understand college requirements, university requirements, and major requirements, right? three different sets of requirements that they must meet in order for them to receive a degree from UC Davis. So can you imagine having to go to three different places and then everybody tells you something different, right? With us, they get that very specific type of attention where they can sit down with me or Daisy and I can tell them, these are your major requirements, these are your college requirements, and these are the university requirements, and this is how we're going to get there together, right? That's the importance of advising. And we do it through a culturally informed and asset-based approach. Right? So what does that mean? We acknowledge the identities that our students come into, into our space with, right? And that's super, super critical. You know, understanding the fact that they might still have uh, family responsibilities back home where they have to call back home, right? I remember being a college student and my parents calling me and asking me to translate for them, making doctor's appointments for them. The reality is, is our students are still facing those types of situations, right? And when we're building academic plans, that's something that other advisors don't take that into accountability, but it is something that I take into accountability. Why? Because I understand what that is like, right? And so, of course, I'm not going to recommend a student to take 20 units when I know that they also have family responsibilities at home, right? So academic advising is super critical. We also provide academic tutoring services. We've partnered with our academic assistance tutoring program. Um, to provide um, tutoring in math, chemistry, uh, statistics, physics, and um, other um, aspects of tutoring that can help our students, right? In addition to that, we also support with writing support. So we bring a writing specialist into our space so that we can help our students with their essays or even just with what it's like to begin that writing process, right? And then uh, last but not least, I also wanna highlight our library support and our internship and career center. So the center doesn't just focus on supporting students for now, but it also focuses on supporting students for later. So what does that mean? That we introduce professional development very early on, right? And we help them partake in those types of, of activities through whether it be creating resumes, creating cover letters, applying for internships, right? One of the biggest things I do to my students is I tell them, please apply for internships. Those are so, so critical, right? And so we really push them to engage in professional development activities that can help them be successful at this institution. So this specific space that we call El Centro serves as more than just a space where folks can say it's a home away from home, right? But it's a space where any Latinx students on this institution can come in and truly ask any question and we'll make sure to connect them with our campus partners, with anyone right on this institution that they need to be connected with in order for us to uh, uh, support them efficiently. So um, I will stop there and I will pass it on to my colleague. Thank you, Rodrigo. And now we're gonna transition to Josephine who's gonna talk about the role of graduate studies. Kind of short, so I thought it, that it would be better if I stand. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank everybody for the opportunity to dialogue with you today. And um, I also must start with a cultural acknowledgement, and that is today, March 23rd, is the birthday of my grandmother, with whom I always celebrated my birthday every day, that every year that I that she lived. So happy birthday, Grandma, and. Uh, it's a special day for me. In fact, as a as a uh, example, my siblings we uh, were a very large family. They ha and we're on a thread, and one of them said, "Happy birthday to Grandma in heaven." So, uh, it, it just goes to show how important culture is and our families are to us and to your students. And uh, myself, I I was raised by a mother who. Um, with seven siblings, we're, we're seven, and uh, it was a very loving environment, but a very humble environment. And um, oftentimes on weekends, we worked in the fields, we picked cherries, we topped onions, we picked tomatoes, and boy, tomato picking is really tough. Uh, but but that added, that added um, income to our family. And so that's quite common that there are uh, families who are, are very humble families uh, that are, are the large majority of the students that we work with. So uh, for me, though, my family is an example of the positive outcome of affirmative 
action. And that is that my oldest sister, Rose, was admitted to UC Davis in 1970. And after that, our family just came to the campus. So I've been coming on and off this campus since 1970. Okay, I won't tell you how old I am, but <laughs> it kind of hints at it. Uh, and, and we have our 11th family member going to UC Davis right now. And even more than that, that one person, those 10 people, our nieces, our nephews, our cousins, our extended family have completed a bachelor's degree or higher, or higher as a result of educating one person. That's how critical it is that we, at, we, we pr not provide, we expect access to higher education for our Latinx, Chicanx, and Latin A students. So uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, what is the priority of achieving HSI status uh, and how it's impacted the work and our units. So I have the opportunity to work with my colleague, Dr. Jose Ballesteros. And by the way, Dr. Ballesteros is from Stockton. I am from Stockton. You're from Stockton. Who else is from Stockton? Yay! <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Ballesteros, he's the executive director of pipeline programs, and he leads a team uh, with himself for, and he's very, very focused on uh, many new and continuing initiatives. And I just would like to share with you some. And I haven't heard anybody talk about the CSU, so I want to be sure to, to mention that uh, uh, Dr. Ballesteros works very closely reaching out to CSUs and HSIs because we know most CSUs are HSIs, right? And, uh, and that is for the many pipeline programs or recruiting uh, that we do for graduate school. And of course, he also has the McNair Scholars Program, the UC Leeds. I mean, there are many, many graduate prep programs. And uh, my colleague over here had mentioned internships. Well, that's important. Grad prep programs are important to grad to being prepared for graduate school. So any type of proper preparation uh, that students can receive, that adds to their skill level. So I collaborate with Dr. Ballesteros in outreach and recruitment, and we can, I also try to connect with Latinx undergrads at times, and Dr. Lena Mendez has always asked me to speak to their class about uh, graduate level studies, and I call it the ABCs of graduate school. And that is, what's a PhD? What's a, a, an MS? What is a, a JD? And we talk about what all that means. And that is providing information to our undergrads that they may not have access to personally. So if we can share that knowledge, it's really important that they think about if graduate school might be for them. So graduate divisions I think must actively grow and seek a deeper pool. And that's what we do here at UC, uh, UC Davis in grad studies. Uh, and I, I think it's important to, to mention that it is essential that our Latinx teaching assistants, our Latinx labor laboratory grad students can culturally and linguistically relate to our HSI students. I think that's very, very important. And that's because we want are Latinx undergrads to envision themselves as a graduate student, okay? And that's why having more Latino students provides them access to the highest levels of, of education, but it also, it, they are role models in the classroom and in the labs, and that's very, very critical. So, um, I'm very nervous in front of all of you. <laughs> I do want to mention a, a project that I personally lead with the dean, Dean Del Planck, uh, and that is the AMIGA project. And AMIGA is the Alliance for Multi-Campus Inclusive Graduate Admissions. We've been working on this project for six years, and the project has to do with um, moving our um, graduate admissions towards holistic graduate admissions. Okay, holistic graduate admissions. And it's not an easy thing to do. And just keep in mind that undergrads are admitted through admissions. Graduate students are admitted in every single graduate program. And so having a culture change is very, very challenging. However, uh, graduate studies has embraced it. It's very forward. Uh, 
moving and I, I really believe in that opportunity to increase the number of students from Latinx communities. Um, I also want to mention that, so, so I'm, I'm talking about outreach, recruitment, and admissions right now. Uh, and then, but there's another part of it, and that is that uh, we, can be, we can be progressive in outreach, recruitment, and admissions, but we need financial support for our students. We need to support them. Financial support and academic support and community support, that all uh, wraps around like a hug uh, of our students, but the financial piece is critical. And um, I, I am very proud to say that this year, uh, the dean has been working for a couple of years to increase the number of Cota Robles uh, multi-year fellowships. This year, this year, instead of less than 10, we're going to have more than 30 awarded. 30 awarded. <laughs> So that's a very positive move, but let me just say this. 1,100 Latino students are either in graduate school or professional school. And of those 1,100, 653 are in the graduate programs, that research programs that go through graduate studies. And 20% of that 650, 24% of those 653 are UC Davis graduates. Okay, that's really significant. And, and here's another number, of all of those uh, uh, Latino students, graduate or professional, 40% went to the UC. So we can see how significant California is to uh, all of our graduate programs and that our undergrads are admitted here regularly. It's the same at other UCs, it's grow your own, right? Yes, it's grow your own. So um, we're constantly working on providing support for our students, academic support as well as community support. And that's really critical to graduate student success. We offer uh, a, a, the new Competitive Edge Summer Bridge program. Uh, there is a, another program that is um, led by my colleague Devin Horton, that's Graduate Scholars of Color Plus. And there's also a significant effort uh, to support mentoring from graduate studies uh, and professional development. I want to just touch on this last point about mentorship. Mentorship as an undergrad, um, you might, they might have mentorship, but they may not, okay? However, it is critical to have mentorship as a graduate student. And that's because all of the scholarship indicates that mentorship aligns with graduate student success. And they finish faster, students finish faster, and they're more successful in the job market when they are mentored. So mentorship is very important, and I'm, I, I feel very glad, and, uh, and I, I wouldn't say happy, but <laughs> I, I'm, I feel really positive about the efforts that we've been uh, putting forward for mentorship in graduate studies. But mentorship takes every faculty member to mentor, not just our Latino faculty. And that is, that's what happens. Our Latino faculty uh, mentor, our faculty of color mentor, and our faculty mentor our undergrads. So we need every faculty member to mentor. And uh, that contributes to graduate student success and also a very significant effort on the part of graduate studies. Thank you. So I just realized that I was so quick to business that I didn't even introduce myself. Um, so I am Melissa Lee, I'm the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management, and just so excited to be able to facilitate and moderate this, con this conversation with this panel. I did prepare a couple questions with the group and then I wanna be able to open it up for questions as well. Um, the first question I had was, what do you guys see on the horizon? Are there opportunities you feel we have not yet leveraged? Um, and but we should be leveraging, what would those be? Uh, I can start. I, I think, um, gosh, there's so many. There's so many things that we, we could be, it should be doing. Um, I mentioned that I'm a member of the board of the Stockton Scholars, and in that space, we talk a lot about access for, you know, access to higher education. There's very, very little, if any, higher education, academic preparation, 
college access uh, work being done in that region. I mean, it's a city of 320,000 people that has no EAOP, no MESA, no, you know, no TRIO services or very little TRIO services. Um, and so we should definitely be looking at what is that, what does that look like for the rest of the state of California? What does that, what does that mean for Davis as a regional partner um, to serve more Latino, African American, Native American, underrepresented students in, in the region? Um, what do we define as our region, right? I mean, how far does that stretch? We have the whole North State that is also, uh, we, we rely a ton on our TRIO partners, certainly in, in North State to, to, to facilitate that. Um, more alumni engagement um, to the HCC, I see you, right? Like, I, we, we've talked about this too. Um, and we have a small but mighty alumni network that, that, that works with us, but we need to grow that. Uh, we need to get younger alumni in, who've had recent experiences on campus to share their experiences and be involved in, in our program and be involved in our recruitment. We need faculty uh, to be involved with us and, and to, to come to the table and, and gosh, I, I could just see a beautiful like mentorship, like a regional mentorship program that would be so fantastic to get students connected to higher education so that they stick with the process of applying, of going through the, the motions and, and getting um, to the university. That's from my perspective, I think, um, things that we should do. We should also think about holistic review and what does it mean to um, evaluate excellence in all of its forms, right? That's what we're looking for at Davis and what does that mean? Um, and and how, do we, how do we incorporate that into our training? How do we incorporate that into our process um, in, in the admissions office? So those, those are my comments. Okay, I had to make sure I was working. I'm just gonna add two things very quickly. One, I truly do believe that there's an opportunity for growth with um, institutional uh, partnerships, right? So continuing to grow the awareness of what it means to be HSI, what it means to support students, right? Um, I think that's that's a big one because it will. There's definitely a lot more awareness that needs to be created. But um, of course, you know, there's we're, we're such a small team all together, right? And so, not only does it help to create awareness, but also keeping our entire institution accountable to making sure that we're serving students. The second one for me is, what does this look like to serve students in a virtual space, right? Because that is something that I have to pivot this particular year, and I think it's something that we should continue to explore. Why? Because the reality is, you know, in our spaces, my, my space, my physical space is limited. But the way that I serve students doesn't stop there. It continues in a virtual platform. Earlier, we heard about El Chisme. We actually turned El Chisme into a video segment now on TikTok, right? So consistently being aware of what a student's needs are and how can we get them the information. And that is in a virtual space now, right? So for me, Yes, we have lots of data, lots of numbers that reflect how many students are coming into a MySpace, but it doesn't reflect the number of students I'm helping through Instagram, answering advising questions. It doesn't reflect how many students I'm helping support through the APSD process by making TikTok videos, right? The reality is we have to make sure that we continue to be aware how are students getting information? How can we have a wider access and, and to put the information in front of them, right? The reason why I transitioned to TikTok was because I, I found out flyers were not being as effective, right? We literally tested that, right? So exploring that virtual space to serve students is gonna be super critical in my opinion too. So next question I have is for Josephine is, what lessons learned or advice do you have for other emerging HSIs across the country? So we've been an emerging HSI for many years, right? Uh, and I do think that there has to be a very strong effort to not only reach the HSI status of 25% undergraduate Latinx, Chicanx, and Latine, but that's the minimum. We are 40% of the population in California, okay? And we need to, to think on grander terms and that is uh, think beyond the 25. You know, think about the 40. And then I would like to talk to them about graduate school. <laughs> okay, so if any of you have pro uh, programs, I am happy to come and talk about graduate level studies. Thank you. Um, the other thing I will add is um, learn your student population, right? Earlier I presented a model 
this model works for UC Davis. And this model consistently involves. Why? Because we collect feedback directly from students on a quarterly basis. Because their needs change, quarter to quarter. And so for me, the way that I approach my work is to continue to center the student experience, to continue to center their needs, right? And that's through assessment, right? But it can be something as simple as having a conversation of me literally walking out of my office and having a conversation with them and learning about them. But the advice that I would provide is literally get to know your student population because it looks very different at every institution. And that should inform the way that you then approach the type of work that you're doing because to me that's been one of the most effective practices that I found here at UC Davis where I continue to center them in every retention strategy that I implement and every program and service that I provide for them. And that's why we've had such a huge drastic increase in participation and student engagement over this last year because I'm listening to them and I'm asking them, what do you need? How can I support you? Right? And we do that on a quarterly basis, like I said, because their needs consistently change. So making sure to stay relevant and aware of like, what are the trends, what are the needs of our students. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions for maybe one question. Lena, you get to pick oh, from a webinar question and the webinar. Okay, one question from the audience. I guess that'd be cute. I'm Diana Michelle. Um, I'm formerly the Undersecretary for Education under Governor Davis, and I particularly have this question for Mr. Pearman. We know as a community that even though we've had successful outreach programs, it has never been enough in terms of funding or the numbers of students that we serve. Having lived in the Sacramento community for over 43 years and having three daughters, two who are UC grads, one private school grad, and having worked in the schools in this area, the Sacramento area is not well served in terms of outreach or admissions. Um, I'm particularly concerned with the discussion about admission strategies because this particular region has not been well served either in Stockton, Sacramento, Dixon, Vacaville, Woodland. Um, the University of California has a strategy that's international. It's a world-class institution, statewide, but there's a local context. And so if you could speak specifically, because unfortunately we tend to talk about admissions of Latino and Chicano students as part of a strategy that's segmented. I'll use the word kind of separate. And we've seen this historically. So now that we're half the K-12 population, we shouldn't be having a conversation anymore about that we're marginal or we're a minority. We're the majority in this state. So I'd like to hear a conversation, particularly the community members, about a strategy that looks at our local schools. Because until we change our approach, we're not gonna get to the numbers. And the kids are there. Um, the University of California participated in the establishment of Steps to College about 10 years ago. And my husband and I were very involved in that with the introduction of DACA. So I'd like to hear a little bit more. I think the community members here who have worked in this area for 30, 40, 50 years, we're urgently looking at this, not just because we're gray and we're aging, but we're grandparents. Some of us are great grandparents. And we're looking at our kids and they're the majority and this institution serves this region the state nationally. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that and particularly the numbers would be really helpful in terms of understanding the numbers of high schools that you're working in and the numbers of high schools that you're working in where our kids are the majority. Yeah, sure, I can, <laughs> I can address a couple of things. Um, um, you're right. Uh, first and foremost, you are correct. Um, in, in the outreach space, Davis has had, um, uh, we partner with a, a 20, 30, 40 school sites. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me at the moment, but I'm happy to get it for you. Um, in EAOP, Mesa, Sacramento area, Youth Speaks, Transfer Prep as well, um, high schools and community college, middle schools, even elementary schools as early as sixth grade um, that we are working with uh, embedded in schools. Um, 
the pandemic was really hard for those programs to get students to continue to participate. And so we are in rebuild mode at this point um, with, with many of those programs. However, we have had a recent investment from the state of California to help expand. Um, so we are adding another 12 high schools, middle schools, community colleges uh, to, the, to the services that we're providing uh, as part of those K through 12 outreach programs. I'll also say just in terms, you know, being the newest uh, admission director here at UC Davis, um, I took a look when I got here at our, our recruitment strategy and noticed that we had four people on the California team, four people that were responsible for all recruitment in California. Um, and that does not really give us an opportunity to deeply know and, and understand and to make connections with the community. We now have 20 territories in, um, in California. We are actively hiring staff as well, but we've doubled the number of territory managers in California, including one, or two, excuse me, two that are dedicated, one to Sacramento County, one to Yolo, Solano, and Sutter counties as well. So that's intentional effort to, to do exactly what you're asking, right? To be embedded in the com communities. We've heard from our counselors, we've heard from community-based organizations, we've heard from many of you, that Davis has never paid attention to what's going on in the, um, Lupe, you probably have heard Femi say this, the shadows of our own ivory tower, but for us, the shadows of our own water tower. We have not paid attention to that. We have not paid attention to that, and, and it, it has to change. It has to change, because we recognize that, particularly for Latino students, when they are admitted to UC Davis, they come, particularly from this region, right? They do come, 48%, I think, from Sacramento County, come to UC Davis, right? Yolo County is, is in that same ballpark. So if we can foster more intentional relationships um, with, with our community partners, with our community-based organizations, high schools, community colleges, uh, to, to get more students into the pool and then admit them, um, I think we'll be doing what you're, what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So because we do stand in the way between um, you and lunch right now, um, we're not gonna take another question, but I just wanna thank the panelists. Thank you very much.